No one can come to God apart from through Jesus. There are many ways to Jesus. And I believe that Elvis may be one of the ways that God put him on earth to draw people to him and then through Elvis to see Jesus and to see God. And then a moment for personal testimony. Thank you, Elvis, for that. I became an Elvis fan just last year, although I'm over 50. And my son's been an Elvis fan for two or three years, but I really became a mega Elvis fan at the beginning of last year when I watched the 60th birthday celebration films on the television. And since then, I've been to Memphis, um, what this scarf in Memphis, and I really, really love Elvis. Elvis's music, music is one of the chief ways uh, by which religions have expressed themselves and have helped people to apprehend those deeper currents of life. People feel profoundly touched by this and, uh, and, and feel in some sense released and loved. what has happened is that I, I'm perhaps recognizing that the mission that God had for Elvis and my faith has changed in the sense that I've become more excited as I realize how God can move in the world today. People see in Elvis something very very special and I believe what people see that's special in Elvis is God, is the Holy Spirit. And I believe it's God's way of drawing people to himself. You can actually experience the divine and have some fun at the same time. Uh, you know, especially in the Protestant world, religion has become so grim. Uh, you know, you, it's, 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 it can be, not always of course, but it can be. Here's uh, the individual alone with his Bible and his God. So that I think that perhaps that, that may be part of the appeal. We're being taught to come to God with humour. Uh, that's something that's lacking in con much conventional Christianity. My passion with Elvis is fun. I uh, worked very hard all my life, raised children. I am now a grandmother who wears trifocals, and I'm ready to have some fun. Thank you very much. This is a piece of mortar stone from the office of the gentleman, the doctor, who delivered Elvis and his twin. This is the powerful Elvis prayer candle, and on the back, the prayer reads, Accept my fervent and sincere prayers that through your great power I will have the strength to endure various Elvis impersonators. Help me to always remember the King's magnificence. Amen. You can never be quite sure with Presbyterians who's kidding who. Some of the most outrageous, yet least serious references to churches of Elvis can be found by trawling through the internet. This is the first Church of Jesus Christ Elvis. In reality, it probably isn't actually a church. It was actually created, I, I suspect, by um, uh, the artist Chris Rivals, who um, has created all this um, Elvis iconography. He's taken your classic, um, a Catholic in this case, uh, iconography, and he's transplanted Elvis's head onto it. But it, he's actually uh, done a little more than that. I mean, for me, this is quite an interesting piece of, uh, of pop art as well. This is the Elvis stamp, except that uh, the roles have been reversed. Um, Chris has portrayed it here as the, the face of Jesus, Jesus as the pop star. But the words are, all have sinned, you ain't nothing but a human, sinning all the time, just an ungrateful human, sinning all the time. No, you don't deserve salvation, but you can be a friend of mine. This is yeah. a complete confusion then, isn't it, of the two figures, Jesus and Elvis? Oh yes, yes. Welcome to the only religion that will matter in the next millennium. The first Presbyterian Church of Elvis the Divine now, this again, I'm sure it hasn't started off uh, as a full-blown church, but you know, as people invest more time into it, it actually starts to take on its own life. This reminds me of going to, when I was a student, going to Rome. It reminds me of all the paraphernalia, 
that surrounded the Vatican, all the little barrows, all the different the tack and um, to be quite honest, it reminds me of the evangelical church. You invest um, yourself, your own energies, and I think it, it, people start to, start to take it progressively more serious. In fact, what they're starting to do are some quasi-religious practices. They go to see the Elvis impersonators, the high priests of, of the new religion. <laughs> Dozens of performers were captured in their Elvis vestments at an exhibition of photographs held last year at a gallery in Mississippi. They put the suit on, they get on stage, they have an audience, you know, the music starts, something happens inside of them that is a transformation and they definitely feel a different kind of energy than they feel certainly in their normal everyday lives. I know that every single one of them has certain things that they need to do in order to psych themselves up, in order to feel Elvis. One impersonator did tell me that he said, you know, becoming an Elvis impersonator is not something you start out to do, but something happens and you, you, you follow the calling. The ones who do the, the later Elvis in the um, jeweled uh, jumpsuits, um, often give out scarves, that's part of the act. And they are always given with quite, quite a good reverence. They put the scarf on, they go down, put the scarf on the woman and uh, gives her a kiss and then it's the next one. So it's quite, it's, in a way it is quite like communion, but the kiss is the communion, it's not. And the scarf is, is something to take away. And it's always a big thing if you're in the audience, you have to feel sort of like worthy. <laughs> To, to get the kiss or to get the scar. David Moore has idolized Elvis almost all his life. Paying his tribute is his vocation. I do Elvis because I want people to know what that man was all about. You know, the kindness, the giving, the sharing, never forgetting where he came from. And Elvis was uh, English, Irish, Choctaw, and Cherokee Indian. And I'm English, Irish, Cherokee, and German and our birthdays are five days apart, so I always felt this connection with Elvis ever since I was five. And to me, it's nothing more than a, a gift that God has given to me. I'm not Elvis. I loved Elvis, like every fan, even my song that I wrote, uh, Going From Graceland to Heaven's Door. It's my gift to every person that loved Elvis. I know I hurt you when, you when I left you. You know you touched my very soul. I didn't mean to leave you, but it was time for me to go. Just remember that I'll always love you and know someday we'll meet again. And it goes going from Graceland to Heaven's Door four times. And it goes, I took the crown that you gave me and laid it at my Savior's feet. I hailed my mama and my daddy with Jesse now, my life's complete. I've had people that have come up that said it was like Elvis was talking to me, and I've had people that said, I just lost a son six months ago, and it was you gave me hope in that song. And I really believe, and, and I really believe that if Elvis could talk to us, it's exactly what he would tell us. From a very early date in the practice of religion, people um, developed the practice of imitatio dei, the imitation of the gods. Uh, they would uh, reenact, usually in ritual form, what the gods were believed to have done, either in the primordial world of the heavens or in their activities here on earth. And by imitating them, you were creating um, a replica uh, in which the divine could be apprehended again. I 
I've had some beautiful experiences, some sad experiences, um, some strange experiences doing Elvis that I can't explain. I'll give you one example. I walked into a um, home where one of the fellas in there was a quadriplegic, and it was his birthday, and they had all these pictures of Elvis, and then all these people are in their chair, you know, like this, and the minute I walked in, I saw a light go on in their eyes. And uh, it, was, it was very hard to get through the songs because I was so moved. And as God is my witness, I heard God's voice say to me, he said, this is why I have you do this, just to make a difference. And uh, I do see it as a ministry, a ministry of healing, a ministry, if I can take a person um, that is dying or a person that has no hope or some, a child that has no love, and for five minutes show them love and compassion, what more in life is there? Like many fans, David Moore does charitable work in Elvis's memory. But his ministry doesn't go as far as some in Memphis and Las Vegas who perform weddings in Elvis's name. My name is Tommy Foster. Uh, I'm uh, the reverend of the First Church of the Elvis Impersonator. Every Valentine's Day is a big deal around here. We marry from 16 to 30 different couples, you know. It just uh, it, it evolved, you know. The uh, ceremony's not really serious, but I'm, I hope they take their <laughs> wedding vows seriously. For now and for always. For now and for always. I give you all of my life. I give you all of my life. Now, ladies. There's the diehards, the ones that are like, you know, really treat him as a religion, you know, like I think like Elvis will be the next messiah, you give it a couple of thousand years, but uh, then there's, you know, another level is just people that are good fans that don't really take all the weird part too seriously, but appreciate what he did, enjoy his music, and come here for the pilgrimage. From the very first years after Elvis's death, the pilgrimage to Graceland took on an unshakable form and ritual culminating in thousands of fans processing reverently past Elvis's grave and holding a candlelight vigil on the anniversary of the singer's death. Nobody in the right mind goes to Memphis in August uh, because it's so hot and so humid that it's quite uncomfortable. But you go in August as a pilgrim to Graceland because it's the exact anniversary. Same thing, you go to the Jordan River on the 6th of uh, January, which is the, the feast of the um, of the baptism of Christ and obviously to Bethlehem on the 24th and Easter week here in Jerusalem and every, every sacred place in this world has an anniversary day where the collapse of time uh, compounds the imminent presence of the sacred and uh, so that's a critical thing. Your relationship with those you travel, you share something in common, there's a community, a bonding that takes place. The itinerary, you don't just go one place, you go to a series of places, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, the Jordan Valley. Tupelo, Graceland, uh, Humes High School. What you take away is very critical. There is something other than a, than a simple memento or a, or a souvenir. There's something that has a tactile relationship to where you've been. There's, there's water from the Jordan River. There's oil that's touched the tomb of Christ. There's dirt from Graceland. Uh, there's a leaf from Graceland. There's a ticket from Graceland. 